You're listening to Tech Society FM. Make sure you never miss an episode and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform now. For all your tech and business analysis and other important topics that revolve around technology and modern society. Hosted by tech entrepreneurs and whiskey enthusiasts, John Nguyen and Alex Thunmo. Hey techies, today we have Holonic, whose mission is to help create a thriving economy in the future of Western Australia, and beyond that, meet the needs of all within our planet. With them, we discover the limitations of recycling, face some tricky questions about what it really means to have a truly circular economy, and all the things we can do to make the world a better place. What is a circular economy? And why do you care about it? <laughs> oh, how not going over to take Dylan to start off with? What is it? <laughs> Tell me. I think Andy and I can both answer this, but I'd start by saying that the current economic system in Western Australia is linear and unsustainable and needs to change. Are you, are you saying that sustainability is, not, is, is linear? Is this the difference between sustainability, the sustainable approach and a circular approach? So let's contextualize it. So yeah, we're in Western Australia, right? We're really good at like digging stuff out of the ground. Mm-hmm. The extractive industries um, have brought about so much success, I think, for us individually. Mm-hmm. My background's in civil and environmental engineering. I've worked in the, in, um, the mining industry. So has Andy as well. Yeah, the, a linear economic system is take, take materials out of the ground, make products. So we take, we're really good at taking a lot of iron ore out of the ground. We ship it overseas to make steel. And we've got a lot of success from it, but ultimately the materials in our economic system become waste very quickly. So the circular economy, I guess, started, it's been around for a long time as a heuristic framework and a model for an economic system in the future that can work for everyone long term. When it started through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, focusing on materials and energy, they've been around for about a decade now. I think they just celebrated their, their 10th, 10th birthday. Yeah, focusing on how can we do materials and energy better in an economic system in the future. But this year as well, I think for us, where we're at, so Andy and I have been working together now for two years at Halonic. The circular economy for us is is a bit more, so I might just sort of hand it over to bring Andy in when I want to do all the talking. So Andy, <laughs> jump in, riff with me. Yeah, so what, what we do sometimes is actually say, push the circular bit away and what is the purpose of the economy? So I'll throw that back to you. You know, for you guys, what is the purpose of the economy? We get up every day, we go to work, we mm. do stuff. You guys are creating stuff. What is the purpose of the economy? I think when we start asking those questions, the circular concept becomes clear. The other one that Dylan was referring to, donut economics, all these new models that are coming up about become clear. It's just okay. a name. So really, that's the question we sort of pro- propose to people. So a thought experiment then. Yeah. So what is the... Why do you get up in the morning? Yeah. Well, even just back to that. So that's, we ask this question a lot, even of leaders, of CEOs, what's the purpose of the economy, you know? It's to, ma- like, it's to make our, uh, our life better with uh, in a, a growing economy, surely. I thought it was just to make the rich richer. <laughs> <laughs> in certain countries. <laughs> in other countries, they try to you know, spread it out a bit more socially. I won't go into that much more. So that, that is the purpose of the yeah, economy, right? The, the etymology, right? The word root origin of the word economy literally means household management. So yeah, we're, cool. in, we're in literally under your house right now, right? Ninja Software's house. Yeah, that's right. We're literally underneath yeah. it, yes. So you guys leave your homes, you know, within Perth Metro. You come to another home or a house here hmm. and you're contributing to the economy every day. You guys build awesome you know, technology products and software. You collaborate, you know, you, you pull in and invite awesome entrepreneurs like myself and Andy, mm-hmm. strategic designers from Holonic to, to come and riff under your house. This is awesome. You know, we're, we're all contributing to the economy every day through what we do. But I don't think we truly understand, you know, how the economic system works, how it's come to be what it is today and how it needs to change into the future. Like Dylan's explanation, you know, talking about materials, taking stuff out the ground. And the circular economy often gets confused with just waste. You know, people talk about better waste management. Recycling is not. It's really thinking about what is the economy? What's going through it? What do we need? What things don't we need? What needs to change? What's wrong with the model? And and really that's sort of the question that we're 
struggling with 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 a lot of people is is really this these misconceptions and really trying to clarify what it's about and asking these bigger questions mm. because really we're only just scratching the surface if we're playing around with recycling and, and materials and it's really about the verb waste you know wastage what mm. we're we wasting which could be materials energy anything opportunities our skills as people you know that our god-given skills and it's really about that for me is looking after our homes within homes so you know looking after yourself looking after your family your, mm. your community that's really what you know the economy is about and not having a negative impact on the on the environment and you know to maximum extent extent on others and so I mean, recycling is a bit of a scam as it is right now right, right. <laughs> it's a yeah it's I a mean right I was about to drill down into oh, that yeah. so we when you talk, you talk circular people think oh, I could just start recycling more or use paper yeah. straws right but the thing is people don't really understand what you've just said it's too it can be too high level and yeah. re- my, they, they understand recycling though yeah, my, so. my favourite my favourite example of recycling is from Dubai where there was this massive bin right and Massive bins, and there were, it, it was it was segmented, you know, general waste, food waste, recycling, and then you actually look inside oh, it's the like bin. One, one big bin, and right? it's one big bin. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us more about recycling. Yeah. Well, I'll just I'll I'll say that recycling is actually the last thing that happens in a circular economy. So the first principle, and it depends what sort of. So we talk two narratives when we talk the circular economy transition, and there's been a really big shift shift even in the work we do because we're living through a global pandemic at the moment mm. and there's our current economic systems fractured you know mm. and there's been some great great change so I'd like to talk a bit bit more about that but yeah recycling is the last thing that happens in the circular economy and, and I'd like to sort of bring up the three principles which the Ellen MacArthur Foundation use in a circular economic system and this is really about led by design and how we can you know, everyone can contribute to a new economic system in the future. So the first principle is to, d- to design out waste and pollution. So if we designed out waste and pollution, we wouldn't need to recycle things. Mm. The second principle is to regenerate, sorry, keep products and materials in use. And the third principle is to regenerate natural systems. So we always talk, Andy and I are both designers. Mm-hmm. Um, we're working in Western Australia, Australia and internationally, but mostly in WA, using design-led interventions to actually accelerate and transition the Western Australian economic system from linear to circular. So that's kind of what we're about. It all comes back to design. So re- we really, it's like, you know, we started our business two years ago. We spoke at the state waste conference. We worked with some of the biggest waste management um, companies in the state, mm. sort of startups and SMEs. We still work with some of them, but it's all about upstream interventions to actually design out waste in the first place. It all comes back to design. There's a famous saying we use, 80% of a product's environmental impact starts, comes at the design stage. So, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd rather not talk about recycling because it's not the future. And with that comes the energy usage as well. Yeah. 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 So that's oft, that often gets missed. So like we said, mm. and it's really about taking that ho- more holistic perspective for you guys for with the example of ride fair mm. yeah you're actually looking at it from a more holistic perspective where's that money ending up where's the you know the 25 cents in the dollar that the uber get that's pulled out of the local economy you guys are looking to keep it here yeah, or circulate right. in the communities wherever you guys are running your platform mm. yeah so yeah, you're thinking how how does money circulate within a community yeah well and and that ride fair to us solves that problem of a lot of the savings to be able to operate a rideshare service are global, you know, global scale. But how do you keep the majority of the actual money local? And that's that's the problem we've, we've tried to solve there. Yeah, I think ride ride fare is a great example we could talk about if you're up for it on this pod because it contextualizes the circular economy in WA. It's why you know when Lan asked me to be a volunteer steering committee member, I just without hesitation, I remember chatting to Andy about it, and I go these guys from ninja software are freaking awesome and they're probably building one of the first circular tech products that's going to scale and become mainstream in the next few years and we really believe believe in it and it's like ninja software and ride fair is helping us with the work we're doing because it's an awesome story so oh that's cool that's that's really humbling to hear i still want to know what's what about ride fair spoke to you as circular tech so I was telling that story about I remember when I first met Andy it's we've known each other what now for over 2 years and I think we were we just set up the business I think we were out just getting to know each other or something um I can't remember exactly where it was but 
we had a few beers and, and Andy was like, I just don't use Uber, Ola and Didi. I refuse to get in these ride shares. And I said, oh, why is that? And he goes, Till this is, and he explained to me how the business model works mm-hmm. and particularly the financial models and the fact that, you know, he even sort of used this story where it's like, it's like this money immediately. As soon as you get in a, in, you know, one of the big three ride shares in WA, it's like this money's just flying out of the local economy, Yeah, absolutely. you know? And I was like... I remember going home that night just being like, geez, like, you know, I've thought these, I remember meeting the state manager of Uber in Perth three or four years ago. We did some work. We were using Uber data when I was a civil engineer and me and one of my mates got introduced to her and went to see her and and all the data and stuff. I was this is so cool. You know, Uber's this amazing company and I was kind of blown away. And then, you know, fast forward two years now and I'm like... This is horrible. Like I mean, I, both things can be true. They yeah, are they are yeah. an amazing company. But yeah, what completely agree. Just to clarify horrible. that, yeah. you know what they've what yeah. they've done. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm probably sort of as polar is polarizing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. So that story around Uber and, and I've really and even shared that with a lot of my friends since. It's like if I can ride my bike, walk, get a lift, or avoid using a rideshare service. I will. You know, we, we still use it a little bit for our business, you know, for getting around to workshops it's, and that sort of it's stuff. It's too convenient. He does. Yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Andy, and I absolutely respect that. I don't own a, I own a vehicle, so I get around um, on public transport. I ride my bike. You know, I tend to try and um, live the story of circularity through what we do. I use Car Next Door. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that, but I can basically book a neighbor's car on demand. Oh, wow. That's so, cool. Uh, I've never yeah, heard of that that's before. That's been in Perth for like 18 months, two years, I think. Wow. And I, some guy spoke about it who flew over from Melbourne from Shareable about that, and I went home, downloaded the app, and booked a car the next day. Wow. That's, right. that's, oh yeah, I've never heard of that. That's yeah. very cool. It's one of the best kept secrets. You know, there's, you know, you talk about the sharing economy and access over ownership, and there's all this stuff in our own backyard we don't even know about. So. I do, I do really miss having a car, so I must admit that. But it's been a good, it's been a good experiment. But um, bringing that back to ride fare, it's like you know, I wouldn't hesitate to book a ride share in a ride fare. You know, in fact, I'd go. That's why I was saying this to you guys before the podcast. It's like, you know, getting ride fare merch. I'm trying to convert every ride share I do get because I'm like, how can I make the most of this experience when I know that, you know, say I book a fifteen dollar ride fare to get here, Uber's going to get a cut of that. The driver's going to get, you know seven ten bucks or whatever he gets but i want to make sure that he becomes a ride fare customer in the future so that in in one year's time i'm booking ride fares not booking olas ubers or dds so yeah well that's that's the plan and the drivers get it straight away Uh, one of the reasons we even did it is that every time well we already had the tech so that that made that made that decision easy but every time we took an uber the drivers would ask us how much would it cost to create an uber because they don't, they didn't want to work for Uber anymore. But they so, had, yeah. they had to. There was yeah. no other There's choice. No alternative. That's, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. And then new choices came, Ola and Didi, but they were just the same model. Do you think one of the issues is education of the people, not not just governments and businesses, but also just the general the, public? The general public, yeah, especially for um, back, you know, back when we we're talking about ride fare, the drivers already understand the benefits, but the riders don't care because they save they save a few bucks. Is there a lot of education? in this whole circular stuff for the average person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Andy, why don't you talk to your education experience through how you came to, you know, be? Yeah, so there's lots of different university courses sort of springing up in this sort of space. So I was part of the first cohort of students on the first circular economy MBA that was developed in conjunction with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So they're a foundation um, that was started up by Ellen MacArthur. So she was the first person to circumnavigate around the world. And, and while she was away on her boat, you know, she was reading a series of books, cradle to cradle, all these books that, that sort of opened her eyes. And she came back, stopped being a professional sailor and said, you know, I'm going to leverage the, the contacts I've got at big organizations to become founding partners for this foundation. And they basically, within 10 years, have, have sort of started to promote this circular economy and that's sort of taken off in in Europe and other places just to clarify the circular economy as a concept has been around for for longer in China they're doing stuff in other places things are going on and really like I said it's really about an economy and thinking about circular flows back to that China point which city is the furthest along in terms of achieving full circularity 
It's probably it's probably best asking that like at a national level, like at an economic yeah, level. Yeah, like I just want to know in, if I had to go to a country, a state, somewhere in the world, where should I go to see it being yeah, done properly? That's a great question, Andy. Pro- probably somewhere like um, Holland are really pushing it. So yeah, cool. Holland are quite sort of progressive, and I think as well because of the country, you know, reasonably sort of small size con- country with you know high, reasonably high, high sort of population density. density yeah. yeah. So yeah, you know, cool. Not getting the materials, so. You know they 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 realise they've they've sort of got to do this. Is that thing. systemic or is it just a culture of circularity? I think there's a completely different culture there. Mm. You know, where even with people, they're just a bit wise and f- more forward thinking. I think and a bit more open. Even the 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 whole sort of cannabis sort of culture there. They, yeah, they say chill. Know, <laughs> yeah, the pe- people <laughs> have a, have a, have a. I don't know how to explain it. You know, even the Dutch people I know mm. that they, they have a very yeah. open-minded mm. very open-minded mm. they listen to people's opinions they'll have an argument but a, con- a constructive argument not, and they'll listen an to the argument. yeah yeah and you know i think that's part of you know why why they're in this this space it just makes sense makes sense to them which is funny we talk about emotional arguments because on the day of this recording is the presidential debate so oh yeah so some of that before that's that was quite fun. quite yeah. interesting so uh, I, I i watched about five minutes of it and i couldn't just I couldn't wait for the anymore. highlights in the yeah. end yeah yeah, yeah. So does a circular economy require cooperation from other economies as well? Because now we have China and Australia kind of interacting with waste. Is If you were to achieve your circular utopia, would you be independent from you know, outside forces like that? I think, it, I think in this sort of globalized world that we live in, yeah. we need to limit a lot of the flows to become more local. I think knowledge in some ways needs to sort of flow and not be contained as much as it is you know with with all the restrictions that are there so really you know knowledge needs to be in some ways many ways opened up and i think what we'll see is a shift to to sort of more local manufacturing and different processes and and these huge supply chains will you know that that span the globe will reduce down so i think we're going to see cooperation locally and globally in completely different ways. And I think, you know, through COVID, we're starting to see a lot of that. People- I was about to say, the, uh, the pandemic that we're all under at the moment in most of the world, has that has that pushed things along? I would say there's a lot more interest in, you know, different meetings with state government departments, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's people are looking looking at this stuff to build back better. They, I think they're, you know- they're, People are starting to uh, create their own little gardens of gotta, potatoes. Yeah, we got to talk about donut economics, I think, because that's the narrative, like that second circular economy narrative that we're really mm. leaning into. Andy, you want to talk a bit about donut economics? What's that? Yeah, really. So it's, it's taking the circular side, thinking about the environment and, and, and living in within the, the, the carrying capacity of the earth. But at the same time, the donut economics says we've got to sort of live in this, circ- in this dirt, uh, donut sort of space. Yeah. So the outer boundary or the outer circumference of the donut is essentially that environmental ceiling, mm. and the inner the inner circle is the social foundation, the social floor. floor. So in many parts of the world, you know, there's people who are living, you know, underneath, you know, living in poverty, yeah. and the idea is to shift everyone into that that space where, whereby you know, people are living a good quality life, but within the confines of the carrying capacity of the the natural environment. So that's sort of, even the circular economy has a narrative one, which is really getting people on board, not going too far into that social domain because it was a step too far 10 years ago. But they talk about narrative one being the materials and energy and everything else, and the narrative two really being this sort of donut economic sort of space. Yeah. But it, I think that the time has shifted and we're now into that narrative too, into this donut economics. People are really thinking, they've seen with COVID, they're starting to ask the questions, hang on, you know, in the UK, you know, why have we, why have we had all these different restrictions with regards to government spending, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, all of a sudden you got the full or payments and, you know, money sort of just created out of thin air. So people are starting to ask questions, I think all around the world about, you know, you know, they're, they're questioning their, their assumptions. And I think that's really come about by what has happened. Yeah. So Kate Raworth, Donut Economics, one of the best books. So if anyone's listening to this podcast, grab a copy. We keep a copy that you can loan out of our office in Space Cube. We have a circular library. Not physically circular, is it? Yeah. 
I, so I had this, I have to bring this up. This is a joke I've told a lot of my friends. So I had a moment, I think six months ago when I said, you know, being really interested in like sharing economy and tech startups and that, and the, the domain where, and I said, someone's got to do like the sharing economy for books, <laughs> to which my mate just stared at me and said, Dill, it's called a library. <laughs> <laughs> and Maybe uh, there was an app for that. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> libraries in WA, it's like, there's this, I think it, where my mum gets her books from at Riverton Leisureplex in City of Canning, look great library and they've made a lot of good changes like 3D printers and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. They have this like hot release section where you can get a book for a week. But for me, I'm like, you know, if I get a really good book, I want to go away and read it. You know, I don't read physical books much, but I'll read a really good book like Donut Economics mm-hmm. away, you know, when I'm away on holiday for a week. But it's like books mean something. Physical books, like you reading a book is, you know, you can't, it's not the same as an audio book or something. So for us, Donut Economics, but you'll read it once, share it, you know. We share it with our clients, with our friends, with people that come into our office. You know, but highly recommend Donut Economics. Kate Wearworth is one of the world's leading economists, in my opinion, from the University of Oxford. She wrote it in 2016, and it's just blown up since. Because of COVID, partly because of COVID, um, all these policymakers and leaders around the world said, hey, this is amazing. We want to downscale the donut to the city level. And now there's, um, I think they just launched, I just got an email yesterday, the Donut Economics Action Lab, which we're really keen to get going, Western Australia. So if anyone's interested, reach out. It's basically a city portrait. So imagine the city of Perth, which is going through a lot of change at the moment, having a donut model, which is basically a systems model to reflect and look at, you know, the transition to renewable energy for the state of Western Australia or for the city, you know, how much waste we're producing and, and the implications of when we make decisions in our own city, how that impacts you know, the developing world, you know, us to have these great smartphones, you know, the the ecological environmental impacts of the, the people who made them, things like that. So that's where the donut economic framework is incredibly powerful. And I think anyone working as a circular economy practitioner in this domain, they should be driven by that second narrative of donut economics, as well as the great work that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's done with, you know, materials and energy and narrative one. So for me, like, you know, Andy and I talk about this regularly. It's like, I quit my job. I had a perfectly good job as a consultant working for, you know, a multinational and Australian based shareholder owned company. And it wasn't good enough, you know, like I'd go to work some days and didn't want to get out of bed. I, I sort of joke, I was 25, I call it my quarter life crisis. <laughs> I ended up joining Ankle Collective. Shout out to Ankle as well. Awesome, awesome collective based in Fremantle that Andy and I are both a part of. And yeah, I remember just being the reason why I met Andy because I was sort of put that intention out there. I was like, I want to sort of contribute to this circular economy space in Perth. And I'm frustrated because I haven't seen anyone doing it. And I'd traveled around Australia and around the world and seen circular economy consultancies and design agencies, all that. And I was like, why isn't there one in WA? And that's how I met this guy. He had the concept for Holonic and been working on it for many years. And for us, it's like, you know, I think even why our business exists and why, you know, even particularly because of COVID, you know, there's, I suppose yeah, one of the things coming back to that of, you know, where do I want to end my career? Where do I want to be in 2050? You know, where, you know, I'm retiring having kids, enjoying this beautiful, great state where we've got so much, you know, like I'm so grateful of nature, is I want to have contributed to a truly, to, to transition the Western Australian economy to be circular. I mean, it's almost like designing backwards from there, you know? And I say that to a lot of friends, to a lot of clients, to a lot of people, even entrepreneurs starting new businesses that we're coaching and mentoring using circular business design, circular design, strategic design, systemic design, whatever it is, to say, hey, where do you want to be by the end of your life? Because life is, you know, materials are finite, so is life as well, you know? What are some of the big wins you guys have had? So, I mean, on that education, I sort of just wrote a note down. So I will give a shout out to the state government because they have supported our business. So Department of Water and Environment Regulation gave us just under 10 grand for a grant to deliver this year in 2020 to do circular economy education and awareness. So we started in April last year, Circular Economy Perth, WA, which was a meetup basically, you know, having these sorts of conversations. What's the circular economy? Um, Is it waste and recycling on steroids? Is it, you know, this yada yada? I'm a sustainability consultant that just, you know, changed my LinkedIn title to circular economy (laughs) consultant. You know, what am I doing sort of thing? You know, that's a bit of a joke. But And we've engaged, you know, I need to, don't always measure it, but that's had really great systemic impact. And we've basically launched a business off the back of that meetup and that um, group. And yeah, really grateful from the Department of um, Water and Environment Regulation, the state government for supporting that because that, you know, we're meeting an unmet need. So I think in the in the educational space, that's been a win. I don't know, Andy, what's been a win in your eyes for us this year? 
I think, uh, you know, I think the wins, a lot of what we're trying to do is get them, you know, the concept out there, explain this, have these conversations. A um, lot of people don't even know circular economy. Yeah, and, 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 and they're yeah, not in yeah. that head, haven't been in that headspace yeah. just to start asking these questions. Now it's there. So I think our wins are, you know, on the horizon. Yeah. yeah. So we've been working with lots of different small, smaller organizations and um, some bigger ones are sort of getting into this space as well. So, you know, I think the like Dylan was saying with this, you know, even though from a business perspective, it's probably not been a, obviously a huge sort of win. It, it, it it's, it's created a lot of interest in this space from sort of circular fashion through to utilities, through to, you know, looking at plastics, looking at new business models, looking at various different aspects that sort of just rippling, rippling through. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned fashion because a lot of people don't realize the damage fast fashion is doing, right? That's yeah. Huge. So we ran our July theme was circular fashion and textiles and we partnered up with an awesome Lisa Pillar from the South Metropolitan TAFE who Andy was one of Andy's students in the Master of Design at ECU. And we just, it was so cool because I'm like, the more I get into the space, the more I work with Andy and, and we grow Holonic as a business. I'm really, you know, tapping into my like I love tactile design physically making things even coming into your office here and coming into the garage it's so cool like that first experience of a of a product or a space but to have we basically had all these fashion designers come in and there was things people were making dresses out of kombucha there was a guy a uh, shout out to Alfie what's his last name Alfie Germano I think from Nanolos so he grows help me out here Andy he grows cellulose fiber from liquid waste wow. it's like the coolest biotech startup in WA that I didn't even know existed until we put this event on that's cool you know, you know? And, and this guy used to be um, <clears throat> a pretty high level sort of uh, executive and in Gap and other other businesses around the world you know high level guy who's again said I don't want my kids to grow up in this type of world yeah. and he's come back to Perth come back to his roots um, working for this startup you know, really sort of leveraging his sort of contacts to to get that moving. So these things are there. Like like we're saying, there's things happening that people don't know about, and that's I think one of our one of our you know one of Dylan's sort of traits is really to sort of make those connections and get that these concepts out there and connect things up. And like I said, you know, we're we're in that phase of a lot of work has been done going out talking to lots of different people from chamber of commerce through to different economic development groups through to different organizations and it's really about getting the the, the message out there and i think you know this this year it looked like things were going to pan out pretty well and then obviously sort of covid hit mm. but in a way it's been a, i think it's been a more of a blessing in, in disguise yeah is there so, a way to discover like you know you, men- you mentioned all these cool products and stuff is there like a circular stamp of approval that we can look yeah, at yeah so we get asked that question a lot like certification because you don't actually know well yeah. the, the, there's a, a certification called cradle to cradle so you might have heard of heard of that so that's mm. essentially a book that came out a good few years ago now it's in our circular library as well <laughs> that forms <laughs> that forms a part of what the circular economy is yep and that's the certification so there's you know, various different companies. But that, do you see it on like the packaging or something? Yeah, some no. some organisations have it. What I would say is they've ring fenced that certification process, so it's actually quite costly. And I was going to say yeah, the certification processes are just to make it often one defeats group the money. purpose. Yeah. So I say even say this like, have you guys heard of B Corps, uh, benefit corporations? No. So, you know, I mean, that's that's fascinating in itself. So we work with, say, a lot of people, like there are social impact or design agencies that are certified B Corporations. Yep. The certification itself often defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do, I find. It's like, why go through, like, B Corps, for example, and, and like, B Corps is a fantastic movement. It's more focused on social impact, but they have all these environmental metrics. And I know small businesses in, in Australia that have just, moved away from being certified as a B Corp because it's like the time and energy you spend getting certified you could actually use to just innovate and have more social environmental impact you know so it's like you know I almost use this joke it's like A Corp B Corp C Corp asshole corporation you're from the 20th century you're not future fit you know you're going to die unless you change B Corp you're on the journey you know kind of there's a lot of there's a big bubble and focus on social impact particularly in WA and it's like you know let's talk about holistic impact C Corp is like circular corporation or circular organization and don't bother getting certified just do it well i don't think certification bodies carry the trust they used to anyway right like i i don't 
I don't trust the the uh, Made in Australia is a great example. Yeah. So many things stamped with Made in Australia, and you look into it, and they're kind of Made in Australia. Yeah. So so many of the times they they're not what they promise to be. Yeah, yeah. I think you know blockchain and post blockchain technologies in terms of certification. There's a lot of hope there. You know, and the role. Uh, yeah, that's probably something. But again, it's taken that to, whole but. that holistic sort of uh, approach. You know, the yeah. big blockchain thing. You know, the processing requirements, the energy requirements there. Well, yeah, but, I mean, sort of blow, is Yeah, it so blows up. So. Yeah. yeah, so you know, there's all sorts Some of different. Some blockchains are. Let's talk about <laughs> exactly. Chain. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, going back to that, you know, there's even here in Perth, there's there's a startup called Climate Clever. So um, yeah, we've we've actually been going doing interviewed. Um, cool, he's been on this podcast. Alex Coran, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. cool dude. Well, all this move away from the stamp of approval is concerning to not me I, but others, I'm sure, because now it's just an exercise in marketing and actually telling your customers that you're circular and doing everything right. Yeah, it's I mean, hard to it's let, hard your, to prove. let your product or service speak for itself. So mm. these guys, they make a, just an awesome kombucha. Mm. It just happens to come in a reusable, refi- refillable bottle. They yeah. get delivered to your door on demand on subscription. You know, yeah, they, they don't right. even use the word circular. Yeah, because there's been a few times where you know a lot of businesses they they sell products that have a message, a very strong environmental message, but underneath they it's don't all, do that at all. It's all bullshit. Yeah. 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 And, that's, and then, that's the concern, you know? And this is the thing, you know, we are, we love to pigeonhole stuff, and it's the same with music. You know, what type of music do you... Mm. Yeah, what genres do you yeah, like? what genres yeah. do you like? And it's like, a lot of the times it's just a certain music or a certain thing, and you can't put it into pigeonhole, and really that's the thing. And one of the reasons why we didn't call Holonic Circular This or Circular That is because, yeah. again, it's just a, a name. Yeah. It's just a narrative to pigeonhole something. And we're using it to to accelerate this shift which is really a shift an economic shift that needs to happen mm. we're, we're seeing it across the world with yeah. this pandemic we're seeing that serious things need to change mm. so, so what about plastics uh, do, do you think we should just stop using plastics I think plastics are an incredible so we did an event in December in partnership with Curtin University called the New Plastics Economy we okay. had one of the awesome friend of mine Leela Dykes Hoffman from um, UWA she did her mm-hmm. PhD at UQ and now she works with the Alan MacArthur Foundation in their new plastics economy team oh, based in the cool. Isle of Wight. So she was in Perth for visiting her family in Margaret River. So we threw together this event. <laughs> nice. We had a bio um, plastics entrepreneur from UWA who'd worked for the, the Ocean Cleanup. She'd worked for Mindaroo Foundation and now she's, I think she's she's now working for Ulu, which is a seaweed and bioplastics. So oh, they're a fantastic cool. technology. Like, look, we wouldn't be able to record this podcast at the moment without plastics. Yeah, that's you know, they're so 100% ubiqu- right. ubiquitous mm. in our lives. But the whole idea of like ocean plastics, right? Like I always use the term, it's like all the plastics that have ended up in the ocean have gone through someone's hand, yeah. you know, like a single use container. Like I, I've been down, I live in near Mount Pleasant and Dome coffee shops still have, still serve single use um, coffee cups that end up in landfill, single use straws. I've actually yeah. picked them up out of the environment, you know, 30 meters away from the coffee shop. And I've said to the owner, hey, instead of waiting for the state government to ban single use plastics, which is coming in the next sort of 12 to months or two years, why don't you as a business owner take the front foot and, you know, move to a better model, you know, because they're leaking out into the environment because a lot of times people don't give a shit. Yeah. And I think, you know, Dylan sort of addressed, you know, plastic isn't the problem. Mm. Yeah. There's people and how we use it, and we're not like we said before. We're not going to recycle our way out of this mess we're in. I don't think you can really recycle plastics fully anyway, right? You can. I think it's just because they're. So we have. It'd be really cool, you know, if we had. There's a great startup which just went through curtain ignition with our support. Oh, yeah. Keto Plastics, Mary Lynn Kasu. She's been one of our favorite founder and entrepreneur customers in this year. She's trying to start, and he's done um, some worked closely with them as well. The first plastics sort of reprocessing, re- recycling, but reprocessing and remanufacturing, and wow. they actually have the polymer ex- expertise to depolymerize plastics. You know, wow. turn them back into oil, and then turn them back into plastics again. Wow, that's um, really cool. Yeah. yeah, but again, we're still addressing. We're st- mm. You know, it's just yeah, a, a not- more advanced form of recycling. Yeah. You know? yeah. Before we continue this podcast, here's a message from our sponsor. We believe that you can create art and beauty with technology. We think big. We move quietly. We are Ninja Software. I got a I got a far off question for you guys. So, 
SpaceX is going to move to Mars soon. <laughs> and um, there's there's some good room here for a fully cir- circular tech for the entire colony. Now, is this something that's achievable in your opinion? Or, you know, is there some waste that has to be made? So, I'll, I'll hand this over to Andy, but <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question because I don't think we should be leaving this planet and this home. And oh, okay. my, my, my focus is on, you know, this is the shared home, Earth. And I think we can truly thrive in abundance on planet Earth in the future with everything that we need. I'm just thinking yeah. of, a, of a nice, yeah. uh, I, look, nice bubble. Which yeah, is a and experiment. I don't think like I don't think I'll go to Mars or whatnot in my lifetime. But I don't no, know. I don't think Andy, I'll but just, just Andy? to throw throw <laughs> throw that back with a different different opinion. Or it's, it's it's a good question though because I was actually I was just reading. thinking of it as like a bubble, right? And you can now control. You, you have to waste as little as possible. Well, I know that some of the uh, low waste and and <coughs> recycling tech has come from NASA building certain things mm. due to the limitations of astronauts. So I think I think it's one of those things where going to Mars, the technology could it improve makes, things here on Earth, and it makes business sense to to build that tech when you when you move to Mars. Or but I want to hear yeah, Andy's please. answer. Yeah, hit yeah. us. I think there's the the tech question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Obviously, going to Mars, you need all that technology. You know, you got to think about things like entropy. Mm. Mm. We won't go into that. It's pretty sort of full on. So there's always going to be some impact yeah. on an environment. You know, it's to have a completely perfect system is pretty much impossible. But I think it comes back to the behavioral stuff. It's like the the whole Ellen MacArthur, you know, she essentially went to Mars on her own. She had a boat, you know, her colony was her boat and her supplies, Yeah. you know, and she had to change her behaviors and live in a different way. It changed her. So it become it comes back to people. Yeah. It comes back to that question of collaboration on all levels, changing your behaviors, collaborating better, we find it hard to collaborate, you know? Yeah. Yeah, even even our, even ourselves, you know, me, me and Dylan, you know, we, we have to learn how to collaborate together and, you know, when to stand our ground, when not to, when to do this. Yeah, you know, you guys as well mm. in, in a business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And really it's that, really for me it's, yeah, tech's part of the, part of the solution, but it can only get you so yeah. far. Human first, tech second. Speaking of, Absolutely. speaking yeah. of tech, I have another follow-up question. You guys love your tech, don't you? Of course we do. Yeah, yeah. you're a tech company. <laughs> what is your yeah. opinion on nuclear energy, solar energy, and you know the amount of work that goes into it, creating the PVs yeah. and stuff? So you know? en- energy more holistically. I was having this chat with a, a good friend of mine. He's just like a serial entrepreneur. He worked. He studied environmental engineering with me at UWA. Um, worked for a wave energy company mm-hmm. and now he's building a carbon, what did he call it, carbon negative or carbon neutral distillery in Esperance, the Esperance Distillery Co. Shout out to you, Jimmy, to nice, James. Uh, what are they distilling? Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But okay. in terms of energy, I remember having this chat with him of why he left the wave energy company that he was working for and he was traveling the world doing awesome work, but it was around talking around fusion and the future of energy. Yeah. But you know, I think, you know, I'll hand that one over to Andy because that's a, that's, a, that's a curly one, but it's like we need to move towards a renewable energy fast. Yeah. You know, if we're going to tackle some real complex challenges, like it's a no-brainer, you know, like, so I, that's sort of my two bob. Yeah, I think with the, on the nuclear side of things, obviously the, the risks, if something goes wrong, mm. as we've seen many times, sort of outweigh the... <clears throat> The benefits from an energy perspective. Well, that that wouldn't apply to fusion, though, right? No, fusion. Well, if we had fusion, we would, you know, would be. It's inevitable, in- isn't it? I mean, well, you know, fu- it might take a while, but yeah. you know, because fusion doesn't have that positive feedback loop, so you turn it off and it actually turns off. But I think fusion. Or is it the other way around? No, that's correct. That's, that's correct. Right, yeah. It's just uh, fusion is one of those things that have been in, in the making for, for oh, uh, we could 50 definitely, years. I could recommend there's a guy, I forget him, his name off the top of my head, but I've seen him talk in at Space Cube before yeah. on the future of energy. Yeah. Real it's good. Like, it's like the, the, good the, ITE, the ITE fusion project is set to generate net positive after decades of work and it's like a tiny amount of energy just to prove that it can happen. Yeah. Right? So, sorry, please continue. Yeah. <laughs> no, for sure, you know, is, you know, you look at stories like Nikola Tesla and stuff, you know, some of the stuff he was doing, experiments, you know, and things get shut down. Yeah, you know, of course. You know, this has questions of the, the underlying motives, and I think that's what comes back to the underlying factor is, you know, can we, can we create a world, a non-extractive world, on an extractive economic system? Yeah. If that makes mm, sense? Yeah. Financial system. I, I pose this question even to, like, I use this example... Like there's, I think the last best estimate I got was there are like 
how much, like I asked a question to a mentor and old boss of mine who works in the iron ore industry. I was like, how much ore is left in the Pilbara? Mm -hmm. You know, like lithium is a big boom run. There's a lot of great work happening around the circularity and the role WA can play in the lithium value chain globally. But iron ore, it's like, you know, what are, like what's BHP and Rio Tinto going to do when there's no more iron ore in the Pilbara? You know, it's like, could they be, you know, life cycle managers for steel? You know, could they lease and manage like some of the biggest skyscrapers in the world? Like that sort of thinking, yeah. you know, it's like you're, you have a business model that, you know, needs to change into the future. What are you going to do? I think they mine asteroids, right? Like that's the, that's yeah. The, yeah. Well, that's the next step. It's still an extractive, like you're reliant on, you know, what we call a 20th century business model like yeah. you know you're not going to be relevant you're not going to you know thrive in the future and like things need to change and there are people you know we've you know worked and talked with entrepreneurs and leaders within these large organizations they know it you know mm. there are you know circular economy like circular economies on the agenda for you know some of the biggest organizations in australia so it's a really exciting time like you know if you're not across the circular economy get across it read done in economics you know connect in with us you know there's a great national open slack called um circular economy australia that's free for anyone to join what's what's the what's the australia oh, australia wide community like for the circular economy approach yeah so that's kind of like i think um in between andy knight Halonic, it's like i'm more sort of i'm naturally we have a really great complementary skill set i'm more sort of extroverted than people facing i love facilitating experiences and bring people together i think the listeners can tell yeah, 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 yeah. It's nice and sometimes i have to yeah. tell him to shut up but yeah <laughs> I sometimes i also have to bring him in and make sure he talks as well because i know i know i'm learning you know to have the awareness when to shut up i think it's good it's been like there have been people in Australia, like if I look back, even so I'm 28, the last 10, 15 years, like there was Candace Quartermain in Sydney started Circular Economy Australia and tried to do stuff. She now works in the UK. Jody Bricko in South Australia. Like there's all these pioneers. Are they ahead of us though? Of, well, of WA? Well, there's a great, like I call it healthy competition. So we're connected nationally. We've done work in Sydney, a lot of great work with for Planet Arc, who got federal government funding. So November 24, they're launching um, the Australian Circular Economy Hub, which is an open platform. Like we'd love to get people like yourself and great tech developers, like it'd be a great platform to promote ride fare as a story. But like it's it's misunderstood the circular economy. And you know, I even joined, there was a recent initiative that we're supporting called the Australian Circular Economy Practitioners and I asked the question, of what does it mean to be a circular economy practitioner? You know, there are a lot of people there like... crickets? Like, yeah, there was a lot of, it's, <laughs> that's, that's one something yeah. we do. We ask questions, you know. Yeah. There's sometimes, you know, go away and think about it. Even at the start of the podcast, we asked you two, what's the purpose of the economy? You know, you've probably, I don't know if you've ever been asked that before. I asked the question as well later on that, you know, chat. It's like... And just to clarify that, I asked, you know, my professor that at uni. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, he didn't go, have an and he was, yeah, he was. He didn't have an answer, yeah. and then he came back to me and said, "You know, yeah. Yeah. that that was it's fundamental." You one, know, one of the biggest challenges I think it's like I brought this up on the chat, and it was uncomfortable. Like I knew people on the call, we've had people at our events. It's like it, it, and I think maybe a neat way to sort of like land the pot as well is it comes back to the individual, the mindset. You know, as an entrepreneur, or a leader, or a founder, it's like you know, Andy and I do a lot of work um, quite closely with coaches and advisors you know in my sort of development even this year through COVID when I've had really challenging times like I've been cooped up at home when I'm an extrovert you know and I'm not in the conditions that I need to thrive yeah. you've got to work on yourself and your mindset your ability to lead and be a better human every day and I think you know Andy and I have these conversations we keep each other in check Andy knows when to go hey Dill you're out doing too many podcasts you know mucking around with all these cool guys in WA get some work done come back into the office stay at home today you know you're more productive but it's like working with coaches and people and doing the work on yourself and that comes back to collaboration that comes back to what's holding us back nationally in Australia to truly transition our economic system so that we're all better off so that we're all better off all right. Uh, well, let's let's jump to our uh, final question, which we always ask at the end of every podcast. I don't know how. I, I'm sure you guys are familiar with MMA, wrestling. Everyone has their intro music. Fighters have their intro music, <laughs> right? So, what are your? Actually, I'm going to ask three questions. What is Holonic's intro music? Ooh. And then, what is your personal introduction music? So, you know, you're coming out on stage. You're giving a presentation. It's a, it's a fun one, yeah. So it's a big, big stadium audience, and what's the what's the music that's pumping as you're walking out in oh, front of everyone? That's good. I'll, I'll answer. Yeah, 
that's a really good question like that's a tough one to answer on the spot as well I think for me so like I'm, the someone f- actually turned it around on me once and they're like well what's yours I'm like shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah for me like someone asked me so I turned 28 a couple of weeks ago and Andy and I sort of had a bit of a nature retreat and celebrated all the success we'd had with Hellenic so far but my life's been such an adventure and I love travelling and um, even reflecting on COVID-19 and this boom in like ecotourism where we're not getting any international tourists into our state but we're all just going out and immersing ourselves in nature and we're so much better off for it mm-hmm. I mean I, I mentioned before that circular entrepreneurship's booming in the regions because there's all these opportunities so I was listening to a song the other day is it Love Generation I used to ride around my, on my bike with my best mate in high school and we rode like 50 kilometres I forget who the, the artist is Love Generation I think it's Bob you can search it up and I was listening, I listened Bob to Bob Sinclair. Bob Sinclair, Love Generation. And it's just like, I used to, it's like, bum, 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 bum. And I used to, yeah, I used to ride around on my bike listening to this with my best friend. And we were just like, we'd lose track of time. Like our parents would call us at 10 p.m. just like, where are you? We were still fishing, you know? And so that for me, probably personally, is is my song at the moment. And if you ask me in six or 12 months time, it'd be a different song. Oh, would, actually, yeah. you, the answer I gave that person the next day, my it. answer yeah. changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, But that's what came up for me. It's like, because even I've spent a lot of time down in the Southwest. I just came back yesterday from Peppermint Grove Beach. We're doing, we've got a big project in Bunbury at the moment. So been flex working a bit more, but getting out in nature. So that's it for me. It's an adventure, you know, and enjoy get out ride your bike and enjoy it so Andy you got one for us so I don't know if you guys have seen these reaction videos there was one on the news a few a few weeks ago to two guys in the states two twins were sort of reacting to Phil Collins in the air tonight oh, in the air tonight nice <laughs> when the drums kick in <laughs> yeah and you know just hearing that and sort of took me took me back to childhood back, my parents yeah. things my parents will listen to so something like Queen I think or Bohemian Rhapsody oh yeah, yeah some of these things that haven't been heard by younger generations and when they hear them they just yeah it blows their mind blows their mind how <laughs> yeah. awesome it is yeah, yeah. like the reaction of these, those two guys you know if anyone doesn't see it just watch it I can't remember what they're called but just the reaction is just immense when the drums kick in yeah on so, that I would say the, did you guys have the the Cadbury's advert here years ago when there was like a gorilla sat behind this? Oh set yeah, of drums? in the air tonight. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was, <laughs> nice. that was seen a it? classic. I don't advert. think so. I'll look after watch it after. Oh, it, Check it, it was, out. It was um, you know, on those like top fifty adverts. It was always number one for like yeah. three years. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, just we'll drop a link into the into the comments. Andy, what would be Holonic song? So if we're and I want to and and here's a good way to frame it. So we I said this to Andy the other day when we launch Thrive next year, which is a we're not probably ready to give too much away about that, but so we want to have secret project. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll get you back on the podcast yeah. when, once you announce um, it for sure. A lot of that thrives about you know the work we truly believe in and our you know purpose around that sort of narrative too and the donut economics and yep. and and just we want to have fun. We have so much fun doing what we do, but when we launch Thrive. We're going to have a party. Andy's a, a real creative when it comes to DJing and audio. So I'm going to pull him out um, and he's going to contribute some stuff that he's created. But what would be, what song would we play at that Thrive launch party, Andy? And as Halonic sort of song, if we're coming to the ring, you know. You're sort of putting me on the spot here. Yeah, well, we can, you know, for me, it's maybe. One, one thing I would, I would say is one artist that I really love is called Beardy Man. I don't know if you've yeah. heard of him. And I just love how he does, like, it's almost stand up. He music is the like drum and bass uh, Any, anything you want he, yeah. he basically Amazing. asks the audience hmm. give me three genres of music yeah. and He'll something to talk about and he just makes it up on the spot and for me yeah. I, the there's cuff. just something off the cuff and he yeah. just blows people away and what, what he can create and and I think that is the sort of space we're getting into is feeding cool. off other people mm. yeah. um, okay. Beanie Man has that TED talk right where he has the equipment that he can um, record and sample on the spot yeah. and he creates so, cool, our, our song so I think be, rather than me <laughs> yeah. doing anything yeah. it'd be cool to have just a series of a people dynamic. that we know who are playing mu- yeah. musical yeah. instruments think, just to yeah. come together yeah. and see what and comes out and I think spot. that's really yeah. that's the emergence jazz. this is one thing we sort of yeah, yeah, yeah cool emergence. this whole emergence thing something is emerging yeah. that you guys are part of we're part of the o- other organisations part of here in the city and part of yeah. a global movement there's something emerging hmm. and that's one word yeah we're, we're gonna we're gonna create a song and we're gonna call it thrive uh, okay that's so that that's, launch party next that's year that's a song yeah that's yeah. It. the one that's made on the spot that's it we've committed yeah. so, and you're gonna be at the launch party <laughs> awesome we will, for so, sure yeah. cool alright thanks guys thank you so much Excellent. yeah that was really good thanks thanks 
the end of another episode of Tech Society. Today in tech history, October 7, 1952, the barcode was invented. This ubiquitous invention was described as an article classification through the medium of identifying patterns, known today as barcodes. As always, this episode was sponsored by Ninja Software. We think big and we move quietly. Check us out, njs.dev. Thank you for listening, everyone. I'm Alex. I'm John. See you later. Bye.